This video is brought to you by It's a Wonderful Life. Own it on 4K Ultra HD, Blu-ray, and digital. You see, George, you really had a wonderful life. Don't you see what a mistake it would be to throw it away? Hey everyone, I'm Rebecca and welcome to Ms. Mojo. Today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 things you didn't know about It's a Wonderful Life. It's gonna snow again. Uh, what do you mean it's gonna snow? Look at the headline. <laughs> what I need is a couple of good stiff drinks. How about you, Angel? You want a drink? Yay! Hello, Bedford Falls! For this list, we're looking at various bits of interesting trivia concerning this holiday classic. So, is this movie part of your yearly traditions? Be sure to let us know in the comments. All right, let's learn something. Number 10. It's based on a personal Christmas card. You should read the new book Mark Twain's writing now. This classic started its wonderful life as a failure. The movie is based on a short story by a Civil War historian named Philip Van Doren Stern. The 4,100-word story, titled The Greatest Gift, was four years in the making. But despite Stern's commitment and valiant efforts, he was unable to secure a publisher. What is it you want, Mary? What do you want? You, you want the moon? Just say the word and I'll throw a lasso around it and pull it down. Supposedly feeling rather defeated, he instead decided to send it out to various friends and family members as a Christmas card. Luckily, fortune was on Stern's side. His Christmas card somehow made its way into the hands of David Hempstead, a producer at RKO Pictures. Hey! I got $2,000! He took an interest in the work, and the production company purchased the movie rights for $10,000, just under $150,000 in today's money. Number 9. One of the first movies released on CD. Randall, now Randall, wait, now wait. Now listen. Now listen to me. It's a Wonderful Life was released on VHS numerous times throughout the 80s and early 90s. But things changed forever in 1993 thanks to the advent of CDs. A company called Kinesoft Development released the movie on CD-ROM, predating the DVD by several years. It was played through a Windows PC and even contained some DVD-like special features, like the inclusion of the shooting script that allowed fans to follow along as the movie played. Listen, listen to me. Thank you. It became the longest video that could be played on a personal home computer, which at that point was limited to about 35 minutes of video playback. Let me look at you. Oh, I could eat you up. Number 8. The Bedford Falls Set Yay! Hello, Bedford Falls! Bedford Falls seems like such a nice, quaint little town, and it makes the perfect setting for an introspective and personal Christmas movie. And it's all fake. Bedford Falls was nothing but a movie set, and it was absolutely enormous. The sets were originally designed for a 1931 epic called Cimarron, which won the Academy Award for Outstanding Production. The set covered four acres of land, and the main street stretched the equivalent of three city blocks. Pottersville? Why, you mean Bedford Falls? The set also consisted of a working bank, 75 individual buildings, and 20 full-grown oak trees that were planted specifically for the movie. It was a genuine winter wonderland, only… Not in Bedford Falls, anyway. Number 7. The set was boiling. As impressive as the set was, filming on it proved quite a nightmare for the cast and crew. The movie was filmed in California from April to July of 1946 in the middle of a heat wave. No, it's not cold enough for that. Not nearly cold enough. Wait a minute. Needless to say, the soundstage grew quite hot and uncomfortable. The set would reportedly hover between 90 and 100 degrees, an uncomfortable situation that was made even worse by the wearing of large, bulky winter coats. The situation grew so dire that some people suffered from heat exhaustion, forcing director Frank Capra to give everyone an unscheduled day off. Must be that jump in that cold water. During George's attempt on his own life, visible beads of sweat are plastered to Jimmy Stewart's face. It was certainly uncomfortable for him, but at least it made the scene more convincing. Number 6. The bank kiss was improvised. During the bank run scene, Miss Davis tells George that she needs $17.50, resulting in George leaning over the counter and kissing her on the cheek. All right, Miss Davis. Well, could I have $17.50? Bless <laughs> your heart, of course you can have it. You got 50 cents. <laughs> this kiss was not in the script, and the brief smile that flashes across Davis's face was a genuine look of surprise. In the script, Miss Davis replies that she needs $17. However, the director told actress Ellen Corby to say 1750 during filming as he thought the odd number would make for a funny request. 
Stewart certainly thought so as well, judging by the impromptu kiss. Now you just turn this way, I'm not right straight down there. That wasn't the only bit of genuine spontaneity, as Uncle Billy's drunken mishap was actually the result of an off-screen accident and some quick improv from actor Thomas Mitchell. I'm alright! I'm alright! Number 5. Taboo Script Society has come a long way since 1946, and what was considered taboo back then may seem like playground banter today. Some changes were made to the script to appease RKO, much of which seems tame and mild to our modern ears. For example, characters couldn't utter the words impotent, I wish to God, jerk, or even lousy. Dear Father in heaven. Violet was also scripted to say I was out all night, but RKO requested that the words all night be taken out for suggestive reasons. Good afternoon, Mr. Bailey. Hello, Violet. Hey, you look good. That's some dress you got on there. What? This old thing? Well, I only wear it when I don't care how I look. On screen drinking was also a problem, with RKO requesting that no drinking be seen on screen and that, quote, George should not be played offensively drunken. What I need is a couple of good stiff drinks. How about you, Angel? You want a drink? Number four, Bobby Anderson's ear. I want you to take a good look at that face. Who is it? George Bailey. Oh, you mean the kid that had his ear slapped back by the druggist? That's the kid. The late Bobby Anderson played young George Bailey. Unfortunately, the shooting experience proved a little troublesome for the young actor. One scene required Mr. Gower to smack George across the face. So H.B. Warner decided to smack Anderson for real. As Anderson told the LA Times, quote, my ear was beat up and my face was red and I was in tears. Mr. Gower, you don't know what you're doing. After filming was completed, Warner reportedly hugged Anderson as a means of comfort and reconciliation. Well, I haven't heard anything out of that ear since I was a kid. Number three, a new type of snow. It's gonna snow again. Uh, what do you mean it's gonna snow? Look at the headline. <laughs> Before It's a Wonderful Life, on-screen snow was typically made with painted cornflakes. Unfortunately, these proved so crunchy and so loud that entire bits of dialogue needed to be redone through ADR. In came Russell Sherman, the head of RKO's special effects unit. He developed a new type of snow by combining fomite, sugar, water, and soap flakes. Is it snowing? Yeah, it's a start. This unique combination looked real, proved quiet, and allowed for quick spraying throughout the set. Placing the concoction in front of a giant fan also allowed the fake snow to disperse in a realistic and convincing fashion. What's happening? It stopped snowing out here, didn't it? The new concoction proved so groundbreaking that Sherman was awarded a Technical Achievement Award at the 19th Academy Awards ceremony. Number two, it originally concerned politics. I claim this institution is not necessary to this town. In the finished film, George Bailey is a building and loan banker who's fallen upon hard times and considers taking his own life. However, this is a major departure from the original script, in which Bailey is presented as a defeated politician. Who is it? Bank examiner. Screenwriter and novelist Dalton Trumbo, perhaps best known for writing Spartacus, wrote an early draft of the script that was ultimately scrapped. In his version, Bailey is an idealistic politician who eventually grows more cynical owing to the demands and complexities of the job. He was a man of high ideals, so-called. But ideals without common sense can ruin this town. He ultimately loses an election, resulting in his attempt. That's when Clarence arrived and showed Bailey a life in which he ignored politics in favor of business. Nearly all of Trumbo's ideas were ignored upon later rewrites. Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number one, it only became successful because it was cheap. The best things in life really are free, or at least really cheap. Why you ever started this cheap penny ante building alone, I'll never know. When originally released in 1946, the movie received middling reviews from critics and bombed at the box office. Well, hello, Mr. Bank Examiner. How are you? Mr. Bailey, there's a deficit. I know, $8,000. It was generally ignored for the next couple of decades, until popular opinion started to turn in the 80s. A clerical error caused the copyright to expire in 1974, effectively placing the movie's images in the public domain. If you ask me, that's where you belong. TV stations still had to pay royalties to Philip Van Doren Stern, as he had successfully renewed the copyright to The Greatest Gift. But the movie was cheap, 
and countless TV stations picked it up for Christmas content. This ended in 1993, when Republic Pictures won a court ruling and NBC was granted sole TV rights. Thanks to Paramount Pictures, the film was recently restored and remastered, giving it a new life for the next generation of fans. Hee-haw and Merry Christmas, Sam Wainwright. So, is this movie a part of your holiday traditions? If so, what's your favorite scene? I think mine is the Lasso the Moon scene. Or you can come tell me on Twitter or Instagram at Rebecca Brayton or on my YouTube channel. Happy holidays. This video is brought to you by It's a Wonderful Life. Own it on 4K Ultra HD, Blu-ray and digital.